Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to just finish this question. Well, we started it, but we didn't get very far, so I'm going to start it again. And then we are, which is chemical equilibrium, and then we are going to move on to acids and bases. So let's get stuck in straight away. Okay, so if you read this, you can see it said five moles of hydrogen gas and five moles of iodine vapor are sealed in a two decimeter cube container at a temperature of 600 Kelvin. It says the reaction reaches equilibrium according to the following balance reaction. H2 plus I2 gives you 2HI. And this is calculate the concentration of the hydrogen iodide at equilibrium if the equilibrium constant Kc at, is at 600 Kelvin is 0.36. Okay, so let's just think about this for a minute. We know that Kc is going to be the concentration of hydrogen iodide, all squared, all over the concentration of hydrogen multiplied by the concentration of iodine. Okay, because they're all gases. And we know that that is 0.36. Okay, so if we do a rice table, R, I, C, E, and then concentration of the E, and we have, let's just draw this out. Please guys, remember that you guys should be using rulers. And we've got H2, I2, and H, I, well, 2 H, I. 2HI. Okay, and it tells us that we started with 5 moles of hydrogen gas. I don't know why it didn't change color. Try again. 5 moles of hydrogen gas and 5 moles of iodine gas, okay, are sealed in a 2 decimeter cube container. So we know that's divided by 2, divided by 2, divided by 2. And they want us to work out this. This is the concentration, which is this dude here. Okay, now, do you agree that we don't know what this used? They haven't told us how much was used. They don't tell you how much was not used. So what we could do is we could say, let the amount of hydrogen used be, or let the amount of hydrogen at equilibrium be X, okay? Then do you agree the amount that was used would be five minus X? Okay, so we're letting this be X, and I'll tell you why in a second, because if we use that, let that be X, I know we want the concentration at equilibrium, we want the concentration of hydrogen iodide, but if we let that be X, it's very difficult to work out what these are. So let, bear with me and let me show you what's going on. We're going to let the, the amount of moles of hydrogen at equilibrium be X. Okay, because it's a ratio of one to one, it means that because we started with exactly the same amount, we would have used up the same amount and we would have ended up with exactly the same amount at equilibrium, okay, because it's on a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, remember this is I'm using, okay, right? So then if we look at the change, okay, this is what we started with, this is what we ended with. This is how much we use with five minus X. That means we must have made double that. So we must have made two times five minus X, which is gonna be 10 minus two X. So we know that we must have made 10 minus two X of the hydrogen iodide at equilibrium, 10 minus two X which means that my concentration at equilibrium, I'm just going to write it over here, is 10 minus 2x over 2, which is going to be, if I take out a common factor of 5, is 5 minus x, 5 minus x. My concentration, 5 minus x, of the hydrogen iodide at equilibrium is 5 minus x. The concentration of the hydrogen is going to be x and the concentration of iodine is going to be x over 2 and x over 2. Now we can use these things here and substitute into here to work out what our hydrogen iodide concentration is going to be. So let's work that out. Okay, so we're going to go 0, 0,36. So you can see it's actually quite a tricky question, which is why I, I said to you guys to just try it and just work through it nice and slowly. I just want to write it up here because I need the space. So this becomes 5 minus x. Okay, right. So it's 0 0.36 is equal to 5 minus x all squared 
all over x over 2 multiplied by x over 2, right? The hydrogen and the iodine. Okay, so do you agree that that is the same as saying 5 squared is 25 minus 2 times 5 is, I mean 5 times x is 5x doubled, it is going to be minus 10x plus x squared, okay, all over 1. And that is going to be, oh, what is going on? Oh. Keeps dropping the line. Sorry about that. We've got a line got dropped for some reason. Okay, so now we've got 25 minus 10x plus x squared, all over 1. Okay, and then we're dividing it. We're dividing it by x times x is x squared over 2. But what do we do when we divide? We tip in times. So that becomes 25 minus 10x plus x squared over 1 times by 2 over x squared, okay, is equal to 0, comma 3, 6. Oh, and then we have to multiply this out. Okay, what a mission. Must have been, um, sorry, I don't know why that happened. Um, there must have been easy, easy way for you to, for that to happen. Okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, so let us, go through this and I'm just going to erase the table because I need the space. So let's erase the table and erase this because I need all the space I can get. And I must admit this is a very much a level four question. It is not the easiest question which is why I left it to last because I know it's a tricky one. Okay, so let's continue and I'm going to continue in dark blue so it's different. So we've got 0,36 and I'm multiplying the x squared across the other side, x squared is equal to 2 times this thing, so it's going to be 50 minus 20x plus 2x squared, okay? So then obviously we can take that across and we get 0 is going to be 50 minus 20x plus 2 minus 0,36 x squared, so I'm going to get out my calculator and go 2 minus 0. And I probably should be able to do this in my head, but I can't right now. So it becomes 1.64. So it becomes 50 minus 20x. Um, I'm just checking. Okay, plus 1,34 x squared is equal to 0. And now we have to use the formula. I'm terribly sorry, we can't do this easily. So it has to be x is equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And the weird thing grade 12s is, I just want to write this as 5 minus x because that's the concentration we want. The weird thing about this grade 12s is the fact that in maths, they give you that formula. <laughs> okay, in maths, they give you that x minus equals b minus b. In science, which you we are quite likely to be have have to need it again as well, not just in chemistry, but when we're talking about equations of motion, um, they do not give it to you. So you have to work it out for yourself and memorize mem memorize it for yourself. So okay, so it becomes x is equal to twenty plus or minus the square root of twenty squared is four hundred minus 4 times by 50 times by 1.34 all over 2 multiplied by 50. 
So 2 multiplied by 50 is 100. So we can cancel. No, we can't. So it becomes 20 plus or minus the square root of 400 minus 4 times 50 is 200 multiplied by 1.34 all over 100. So we need a calculator. And we get 20 plus square root. Remember, we're going to do both, okay? So it's going to be square root of 400 minus bracket 200 100 multiplied by 1.34 close bracket equals divided by 100 equals Press the SD button and we get 0 0.31. So that equals x is equal to 0, 0,31. Um, that was a 20 plus. We could also do 20 minus. Um, so let's look at that. I wonder. Actually, that was. Yeah, that was 20 plus. Now let's go to 20 minus. Delete. Delete minus equals SD button and that's 8.51 which you can see oh hang on then we're going to divide it by 100 and then SD and that's 0 0.085 so x is all 0, 0, 0.085 and what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a positive and negative but um, actually, this is a negative, so therefore that cancels. I forgot I did something there. So this becomes 5 minus 0 0.31, which is going to be, and again, sadly, I cannot do this in my head, so it becomes 5 minus 0 0.31. Let's try again. Minus 0 0.31 equals 4.69. So we end up with a concentration of 4,69 moles per decimeter cubed. And that is a horrible sum, an absolutely horrible sum. But that is how you would do it. OK, so now let's look at the last part of this question where we're looking at this graph. OK, so remember what I said to you, always, always, always look at your Y axis to read what it says and it says concentration concentration in moles per decimeter cubed so we're looking at the same reaction okay so initially it says we've got a dynamic equilibrium where the concentration of hydrogen and iodine is much higher than the concentration of hydrogen iodide okay now it says the pressure of the system is now changed the graph below shows the changes in concentration of the reactants and products as a result of this change did the pressure increase or decrease at T1? Give an explanation. Okay, so do you see that we've got two moles here and two moles here? So an increase in pressure or a decrease in pressure is going to change them both the same. But do you see that the concentration has increased? Now remember the concentration is the number of moles over volume. So if we increase the pressure what are we effectively doing we decrease in the volume which means the concentration is going to increase so what did we do we increase the pressure an increase in concentration shows that we've increased the pressure right so that was the last question that i wanted to do with you about chemical equilibrium rates of reaction Let's go through some acids and bases, shall we? So there are two models for acids and bases. There's Arrhenius and the Bronsted-Lowry. And you guys need to be able to explain both of them and understand and tell them what are the pros and cons of both the models. Okay, so Arrhenius was first. And what he did was he dissolved acids and bases in water. And he noticed something. He noticed that an acid, when it dissolved in water, formed an H3O plus ion, hydronium ion. Okay, it formed an hydronium ion. And some teachers will still call this an oxonium ion. It's oxonium, yeah, that's right. 
oxonium ion. It really doesn't matter what you call it, hydronium or oxonium. Okay, the point is, okay, nowadays we call it the hydronium, the old name is oxonium. But the point is that when an acid dissolves in water, it forms this H3O plus ion. So Arrhenius therefore said that an acid increases the concentration of the H3O plus ions. Similarly, when he dissolved bases in water, he formed the OH minus ion, which is called the hydroxyl ion. Okay, so as far as he was concerned, acids and bases were described as thus. Okay, if you dissolve them in water, if they were an acid, they formed hydronium ions, and if they were a base, they formed hydroxyl ions. Okay, so for example, if you take HCl plus water, it breaks up, and HCl is hydrochloric acid, by the way, it's one of the stronger ones, um, and you break it up in water, it becomes H3O plus plus Cl minus, so it's increased the concentration of this H3O plus, and therefore it is an acid, whereas sodium hydroxide plus water is going to break up into sodium plus hydroxyls plus water. The water doesn't actually get affected by this, okay? So therefore, you can see that we've increased the concentration of the hydroxyl ion, and because of that, we can say that this is a base. However, there's a problem with this definition, and that is used, that, sorry about that typo, is that it can only be used with acids and bases in water, in water. Okay, so Bronsted and Lowry, Lowry and Bronsted, two dudes, sorry, two eminent scientists um, who basically worked out a better definition in the inverted commas for a broader definition to acids basis. So they used um, Arrhenius's definition, but then built on it. And guys, it really doesn't matter whether you call it the Bronsted Lowry or Lowry Bronsted model. It totally depends on the textbook that you're using or what your professor or teacher was taught at university or school as to whether he or she will say Lowry Bronsted or Bronsted Lowry. Really doesn't matter. Okay, but let's carry on. Bronsted Lowry model defines acid and bases in terms of the ability to donate or accept protons. Now, I can hear you all shouting at me because we know that the only thing that moves in an atom are electrons. So you're saying, how can it be donating and accepting protons when we know that the only thing in atoms that move are electrons? You're talking junk. However, if you take a hydrogen atom, we know that a hydrogen atom is made up of exactly one proton in the middle and one teeny little electron going around it. That is a hydrogen atom. Now, if we manage to remove that electron off that hydrogen atom, what is left is a hydrogen ion. But what is it made up of? It's made up of one proton. So when we talk about acid, Bernstein Lowry model defines acid base in terms of the ability to donate or accept protons, we're talking about the hydrogen plus ion. Okay, that's what we're talking about. So an acid is a substance that donates your hydrogen plus ion or protons, and a base is a substance that accepts protons. So just to think about this a little bit more. Oh, your Arrhenius acid and base spoke about acids with respect to dissolving water and your bases with respect to giving off hydroxyl ions in water. Okay, so they were thought of separately, they weren't thought of together. Whereas here, there's an actual bit of um, relationship between acids and bases. An acid is one that gives away protons and a base is a substance that accepts protons. So we're talking about an acid-base reaction. Do you see it? And this is why acid-base reactions are called protolysis because it's a transfer of protons. Okay, so for example, your HCl and ammonia Okay, form ammonium and chloride ions. So this is how it works. Your HCl breaks up into H plus and a chloride minus ion. 
Okay. So the HCl donates the proton. It gives it away, breaks it up. So since it's a proton donor, it's an acid. So a proton donor is considered to be an acid. Acid equals proton donor. Okay. Ammonia will then take that hydrogen plus to form oh, ammonium. Okay, that's just wrong. NH4 plus. So therefore it accepts the proton. Therefore it is a proton acceptor and it's a base. So a base is said to be a proton acceptor. So can you see that what has happened is that the hydrogen chloride has broken down into hydrogen plus ions and chloride ions. That hydrogen plus has joined up with the ammonia to form ammonium and the chloride ion is left by itself. So the HCl has effectively given its hydrogen to the ammonia to form ammonium. So this is the proton donor, this is the proton acceptor, and so therefore this is acid and this is the base. Okay, let's look at another example. Yeah, you've got what is called ethanoic acid, and I say that as if you shouldn't know it. You should know this because we've done um, organic chemistry and you've done it at school. So this is ethanoic acid, okay? Now we've got CH3COOH, this is water, okay? And you can see you've got a hydronium ion and you've got CH3COO minus. But do you see that your CH3COOH has gone to CH3COO minus, okay? So it can be broken up. Your CH3COOH is broken up to CH3COO minus plus the H plus. So it has given away a proton. It's broken up and given away a proton. That proton is going to join up with the water to form a hydronium ion. So the water accepts the proton. So in this case, this is the acid. And in this case, the water is acting as a base, okay? The water is acting as a base, so it's going to accept the proton to become H3O+, and this is going to be what it becomes when it gives away the hydrogen. Okay, so let's talk about amphoteric versus amphiprotic, and then talk about the different substances. Amphit, and you need to know these definitions, grade 12, so NB, 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 you really need to know these definitions. Amphoteric substance is one that can act as an acid in one reaction or a base in another reaction. Okay, an example of that is water, and we'll talk about that soon. In fact, we're going to talk about acids, bases, and pHs later, but what happens is if you have a bottle of water, the water molecules are in dynamic equilibrium with each other, assuming there's nothing else in them, and they form H3 plus ions plus OH minus ions, and that there is a dynamic equilibrium. So the water molecule, one of them is acting as an acid and the other one is acting as a base because one, of, if this is the acid, it's giving its hydrogen to that dude so it can become H3O plus and that leaves it to be OH minus. So that is amphoteric, something that can act as, work as an acid in one reaction or base in another. Another example is ammonia. Uh, sorry, sorry, water is definitely one, but now amph... So no, sorry, another example is ammonia, sorry, and zinc oxide, but yeah, zinc oxide's a bit weird, so we won't talk about it too much. Amphiprotic is substance can donate a proton in one reaction or accept a proton in another reaction. And again, we're talking water and ammonia. So they're basically two almost identical definitions. The one is saying that one can act as an acid in one reaction and a base in another. Amphiprotic says that an acid can donate a proton in one reaction and accept a proton in another reaction. So I'd almost saying exactly the same thing, but you need to know the definitions properly, okay? Right, now let's talk about monoprotic, diprotic, and polyprotic. An acid that releases only one hydrogen plus ion per molecule of acid is called monoprotic. And the most obvious example is hydrogen chloride. Another one would be nitric acid, HNO3. 
Um, that they would, these two, for example, would be monopartic because they would only got one hydrogen ion that they can give away. Diprotic is an acid that can release two hydrogen plus ions per molecule. So, for example, sulfuric acid can release two. Polyprotic, an acid that can donate more than one hydrogen plus ion per molecule in acid. So, diprotic acids like your sulfuric acid are actually also polyprotic. So, effectively, there's only monoprotic and polyprotic. But you need to understand that sometimes people talk about diprotic and you need to know the difference, okay? So, other examples of polyprotic are your phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Right, now we need to talk about conjugate acid base pairs. Okay, so we've already spoken about the fact that acid-base reactions are proton transfers, proton transfers, okay? In other words, they protolysis. Okay, awesome. We have seen how one thing can be an acid and the other one can be a base, depending on whether it's giving away hydrogen or accepting the hydrogen. Okay, so if we look at this, do you agree that HCl is giving away its hydrogen? So therefore, we can call this an acid. Okay, and therefore, since this is accepting the hydrogen, then this is a base. Okay, but now what we say is that once it's given away its hydrogen, the acid becomes a conjugate base. So this would be acid one and this would be base one, okay? The ammonium, the base, okay, once it's accepted the hydrogen becomes a conjugate acid. So this would be base two and acid two. But what is this really saying? It's really saying that if you had to do the reverse reaction, then ammonium would give away its hydrogen, so it would be an acid, give away as a proton donor, to become ammonia, and the chloride ion, now being a base, will accept that hydrogen to become hydrogen chloride. So that's what this is really showing. So you've got an acid and this conjugate base, and you've got a base and it's conjugate acid. And grade 12s, and we're gonna practice some of this some more, but this is the type of question that they love to ask, especially in multiple choice questions. Okay, so they'll say, which of these is uh, conjugate acids and base pairs? So please understand that what we're saying is that, first of all, it's gonna be a reversible reaction. And secondly, we say this acid becomes a base because of the fact that it's given away its hydrogen. This base becomes an acid because it accepts that hydrogen. So that's how it's working. If we look at this, we've got water and ammonia forms ammonium plus an hydroxide ion. So do you see that the water has lost a hydrogen? It's given a hydrogen away. So it is an acid. And its conjugate base is hydroxyl. Okay. What did it become? It became an hydroxyl when it gave away that hydrogen. So therefore, we can say, well, then obviously, if this is the acid, then this dude here must be the proton acceptor. So he's base two, okay, because it's separate. He's accepting the hydrogen. And what does he become? He becomes the ammonium. He becomes ammonium. So this here is a conjugate pair, and this here is an acid-base conjugate pair. Now it says a conjugate acid base contains two compounds that differ only by a hydrogen ion and a charge of positive one. And that's pretty obvious. Yes, H2O, and yes, the hydroxyl, which has lost its hydrogen and has lost one charge, one electron. Okay. Similarly, here you've got HCl. You can see that it's lost its hydrogen and it's now negative. So it's a lost charge as well. Okay, so let's label the conjugate acid base pairs, okay? So what I'm really hoping is that you guys are a little bit ahead of me and I want you to sit here quickly and just look at this and decide which you think are the acids and bases. Okay, so 
Let's start with this one. We've got sulfuric acid plus water gives H3O plus plus HSO4 minus. So if we look at this carefully, can we identify something which has changed its hydrogen numbers? This change from an H2 to an H and this change from an H2 to an H3O plus. So both of them have changed their hydrogens, okay? But do you agree that this has gone from H2SO4 to HSO4? So what's happened? We've given away a hydrogen. So this is going to be acid 1. Okay, if that has given away its hydrogen, what does it become? It becomes base one. Okay, and now it's easy because then obviously this is going to be acid two and this is going to be base two. But let's just check. This is H3O plus. If it gives away its hydrogen, it becomes H2O. So then you always need to draw the little lines to show who belongs to who. So it's these two belong to each other and these two belong to each other. Okay, so do you notice that here yeah, the water is acting as a base? Okay, now let's look at the middle example. Here we've got ammonium plus a fluoride ion forms hydrogen fluoride plus ammonia. So obviously this fluoride needs a hydrogen, it needs a hydrogen from somewhere. So the ammonium A1 gives its hydrogen away to fluorine to become hydrogen fluoride. So therefore, this becomes B1. The ammonium has given away its hydrogen. It then becomes ammonia. So it's matched up to ammonia. The, high, the fluoride ion accepts the hydrogen from the ammonia. So therefore, it's base one to become hydrogen fluoride, which is acid. Actually, sorry, that's base two, and this is acid two. So then what we're gonna do, we're gonna join the dots. So acid one goes to be a base one, and base two goes to A2. Okay, now the final example on this page, I did it specifically so you could see something. Let me just change color green. Yeah, we've got water, and yeah, we've got ethanoate. And what the hell happened there? This is two different equations. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you exactly what's supposed to happen. Sorry. That becomes OH minus plus CH3COOH. My apologies. That's what that becomes. H2O goes to CH3COOH, becomes OH minus plus CH3COOH. Okay, so do you see that water gives away one of its hydrogens to this to make it ethanoic acid, okay? So therefore water, since it's giving away its hydrogen, must be a proton donor, which means it's acid one, okay? It then becomes a hydroxyl, so therefore it is base one. This is obviously then an acid, which is pretty obvious because of the hydrogen that it's accepted. But what's more important is that it is going to donate that hydrogen away to become this. This is base two. Okay. So do you notice, and this is why I chose these two questions, that yeah, the water is acting as a base, whereas yeah, the water is acting as an acid. So therefore, we can say it is amphoteric or amphoprotic. Either or will work. Sure. Okay, now let's talk about strong acids and bases. Okay, so you need, I've given this example before, but you need to understand the difference between strong and weak and um, concentrated and dilute. Okay, so strong acids dissociate com almost completely or ionize completely, whereas weak acids and bases do not ionized completely. Okay, so to put this in perspective, I like to use a little example. Okay, it's a silly example, but it seems to work with my students. Let's say that you are living in, oh, what is Gotham? You're living in Gotham, and for some reason, you are very, very important um, to the Joker and to Batman. Okay, so the Joker kidnaps you and our Batman's got to come and save you, okay? So the Joker decides to hang you over a big vat, a big 
cauldron, a big barrel, a big barrel of acid. Okay. And obviously, because this is a movie type show, he's not going to kill you immediately. He's going to allow for you to slowly descend into this big barrel while he laughs and cackles and gives Batman time to come and save you. Okay, so this is what's happening. Okay, so if this barrel is filled with, I don't know, hydrochloric acid, okay, hydrochloric acid, but it's entirely filled with hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid. So in other words, there's nothing in this barrel except for nice hydrochloric acid. Would you be scared? Okay, and the answer, the correct answer is yes, because hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. It's concentrated because there's nothing else in that container. Okay, it's concentrated and it's strong. Strong means it dissociates completely. Okay. However, let's say the Joker is a bit dwarf, okay, a bit silly. And he decides instead of using hydrochloric acid, he sends one of his minions. I know there are no minions in it, but let's pretend. He sends one of his minions out, okay, to go and buy some acid. And the minions come back with a whole bunch of ethanoic acid. Okay, so ethanoic acid, when you dilute it, is the same as vinegar, right? You should know this from organic chemistry. So they go and they take it and they shove it into this barrel, okay? Giggling as they do, okay? The Joker's out trying to tease Batman about the fact that he's got you, okay? So when the Joker gets back, he is appalled. He is devastated and you are hanging gently from the hook that is lowering you down and you're not scared at all. Why are you not scared? You're not scared because even though this is concentrated ethanoic acid, okay, in other words there's nothing else in the container except ethanoic acid, okay, it is a very weak acid. It's not going to attack your skin. The worst case scenario for you at the moment is that you're going to taste, smell like um, vinegar and smell like slap chips for maybe a week or two, okay? But that is it, okay? So the difference between a strong acid and a concentrated one is this. A strong acid is one that completely dissociates. It breaks up completely and then for that reason it gives off lots and lots of hydronium ions because those hydronium ions are the things that eat away at your skin. Okay, there's what happens, makes the reaction happen, okay? A weak acid, like for example, your ethanoic acid or any, actually any organic acid, does not dissociate completely. In other words, it has lots of extra other hydrogens on it, just gives one tiny hydrogen away. So that means that it's very weak, so it's going to form very few of the hydronium ions, and that means that it's going to not attack your skin. Okay, so that's the difference between weak and strong. And I'm going to carry on. No, let me carry on now. I've got a couple of minutes. This is excellent. So hydrochloric acid is considered a strong acid because it completely dissociates or ionizes to form ions, okay, in solution. So HCl plus water gives you H2 plus plus chloride. You can see it completely breaks up. And it's the presence of this that makes something either a strong or a weak acid. Okay, so now weak bases, I'm sorry, weak acids is, is when you have a very small percentage of the molecules dissociate to form ions. For an example, HF plus water forms H3 plus plus fluorine, but what happens is they're very few. A better example would be this. Let's say you've got ethanoic acid, CH3COOH plus water. It breaks up into CH3COO minus 
plus H3O plus. Okay, so do you see that there's still up three whole hydrogens connected to this molecule? And compared to the mass of this, this huge thing, it's given off one tiny hydrogen to form that H3O plus. So we could say this is a very weak acid because it hasn't broken up entirely. Okay, now, like I said, there's a difference between weak and acid and dilute and strong. And I'm going to stop here because it's the end of the lesson. We will carry on with this tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.